Okay, so the first um, skin disorder that we're going to discuss is dermatitis. So dermatitis is not um, something that's contagious, um, unless of course it's uh, some type of is caused by some type of um, secondary infection or or whatnot. So you have several different types of dermatitis. One type is contact dermatitis, which is um, basically um, it's a skin inflammation that's caused by um, some type of external irritant or um, an allergic reaction, basically. So some of the type, some of the irritants, it could be um, from different types of chemicals exposed to the skin, or dyes, or um, soaps, or um, things like that. Even like um, poison ivy can cause it. Um, maybe people have latex allergies or things like that can cause contact dermatitis. And you might see some erythema, which we remember we said was um, redness, swelling, puritis, um, which is the, the um, itching, um, or some type of vesicular lesions. Another type of dermatitis is atopic dermatitis. So atopic dermatitis is a chronic relapsing inflammatory disorder that usually begins in infancy, but it can occur in um, adults as well. So it can be associated um, with an allergic um, reaction as well and um, uh, can tend to be uh, uh, genetic in nature as well. Two other types of um, dermatitis are stasis dermatitis and soboreic dermatitis. Um, stasis dermatitis, that's usually, um, it occurs in the legs um, due to uh, venous stasis. So anytime you see the word um, stasis, that tells you that something's um, stagnant or not moving or inactive or something like that. So when we talk about venous stasis, that's the blood is not moving in the extremity. So the blood's pooling in the legs and not um, going back up to the heart like it should be. So that's why you get edema and things like that. And so that can cause um, stasis dermatitis. So with stasis dermatitis, you might see um, erythema, puritis, um, as you know initially and then it might have some um, scaling and petechiae um, hyperpigmentation and whatnot so bereic um, dermatitis so with with that one the cause um, the cause of that one is not really known um, but it, it has been said that it, it could you know result from some type of hormonal influence or nutrient deficiency or neurogenic in infections or some type of seba sebaceous gland um, dysfunction or fungal infection or whatnot, although the cause really isn't known. It's a chronic inflammatory skin condition and it'll occur in areas of active sebaceous glands. So that would be like the face, the scalp, the body folds, um, the sternal area, the axilla, um, things like that. And so these lesions are typically scaly white or yellowish plaques with um, mild puritis, itching, which is itching. So treatment and nursing management of um, dermatitis, um, we're going to educate our patient um, to, we want to educate our patients um, to have good hygiene practices. Um, you know, if they have creams or ointments or things like that or other type medications to treat it, um, how to use those appropriately. You want to educate your patient that dry skin can increase pu the puritis, which leads to scratching and scratching can then lead to, um, you know, causing skin to open or break down or whatnot. Um, if it's contact dermatitis or something that caused an allergic reaction, identify whatever food that caused the rash and avoid that or whatnot. Um, things that might trigger it, you know, are cer certain allergens or pets or whatever other things that might um, trigger it. Um, lubricating the skin well so that it doesn't become dry. 
um, you know, using different whatever creams or whatnot to help um, control or prevent the inflammation and the itching because you don't want them scratching because scratching, again, can cause the skin to um, open. Um, oh, you want to educate the patient that they should be avoiding uh, hot, uh, hot baths. So they want to bathe in um, tepid water, so not hot, not cold. Um, uh, and also, you know, don't um, don't try to bust the uh, the vessels, the vesicles. Don't, you know, I know people like to pop, you know, those lesions or bumps or whatnot, and tell them, you know, don't don't puncture those things. Um, pat the skin rather than rub it. You know, rubbing it can cause um, skin irritations or whatnot so pat the skin instead and then sometimes the corticosteroids um, can help with uh, inflammation or whatnot okay so acne acne is uh, a chronic inflammatory disease and so um, with this one you might see papules and pustules um, over the face the back the shoulders or whatnot um, two types, you have acne rosacea and acne um, vulgaris. Acne rosacea is more in individuals between the ages of um, 30 to 50. And so, um, you know, the, the, the papules or pustules might be, um, you might see erythema um, or whatnot as well. Um, acne vulgaris is maybe what you're more used to so when you see um your teens or individuals with early puberty um this would be the acne uh vulgaris and so um these individuals will have the pustules um you know like i said it could be on the face the back the, the shoulders or whatnot Well, again, you want to make sure you educate your patients not to pop the the pimples or squeeze them or anything like that. Um, that's not recommended. Um, it, it can actually um, cause it to spread to other parts of the body. So um, I know as, you know, teenagers and whatnot, even as adults, you know, we don't like those things on our face and neck and, and whatnot. And so we want to pop them. And that's the what... Uh, individuals tend to do and so educating them not to do that um, you want to gently you know use um, some type of mild soap and water to, to clean um, clean the, the, the areas with um, on a regular basis you want to um, educate the individuals um, that if they have oily hair they want to try to you know keep it out of their face you know wash it um, it's free it's if they can, you know, frequently wash it, but definitely keeping that oily hair out of their face, if as all, if at all possible. Keep your hands out of your face. You know, a lot of times people, um, you know, just automatically just want to touch your face, or maybe you resting your hand on your face, or things like that. Your hands, you know, pick up things and are dirty, and you're putting it on your face and things like that. So keeping your hands off of your face um, as you something else you want to educate your patients about um, using some type of topical uh, medication that can dry um, dry those pustules out um, would be helpful as well also you might want to educate them to um, avoid cosmetics that contain oil um, and use more some type of moisturizing lotion um, only you know on the um, on the dry patches of, of the skin um, maybe explaining it to them as well that diet doesn't necessarily um, cause acne and that the flare-ups may be uh, the result from increased sweating or heat or humidity or even emotional stress as well. Okay, psoriasis. Psoriasis is a chronic disorder it is a non-contagious inflammatory skin disease. 
um, that you might notice some reddish uh, papules, uh, which are solid elevations and plaques that's covered with silvery scales. Um, you might notice this on like the elbows, the knees, the, um, the base of the spine, um, some other areas. It can also affect the scalp, the fingernails, the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, or um, whatnot as well. The, um, the condition is a recurrent course. It, um, it's a recurrent skin condition. So you have periods of remission and periods of exacerbation with this particular disorder. Um, like I said, there is a genetic um, predisposition um, when you have your, you know, the first lesions that, act, from the first lesions that occur, it could be from a genetic um, predisposition, but it can occur um, when, remember I said it appears a remission and exacerbation, it can occur after um, a respiratory infection. Um, sometimes these individuals might also have some type of psoriatic arthritis, which is inflammation of the joints as well. This is just one picture of um, psoriasis. Um, just a picture of what psoriasis on the hand might look like. Um, in your book on page 994, figure 43.1 also gives you some other um pictures of what psoriasis uh, might look like. So many times psoriasis will go into remis remission spontaneously and it'll just clear up um, without any, you know, treatment. Sometimes that does, you know, happen like that. Um, and then, but also many times, you, you know, you're going to need to treat it with something. Um, a mild case, you might use some type of steroid cream such as the Kenalog, um, uh cream as well. Um, sunlight can be helpful. So the, UV, the UV rays from the sunlight um, can be helpful. Um, Dovonax, which is a vitamin D um, cream, it can be helpful for individuals uh, with psoriasis. Um, so like I said, topical medications, you know, such as the, the corticosteroids, the cold tar preparation, um, or shampoos if the scalp is affected. So, you know, something like that, um, can be helpful, uh, with this condition. Now, like I mentioned, the tar preparations, the tar preparations can come in different forms. So you can do the tar preparations, um, for baths, they can use topical applications or like I said if your scalp is affected you can um, use shampoos with the um, tar preparations um, as a treatment now if it's severe you might need some type of um, combination be with the UV radiation and um, cold tar preparations but if you have to have that combination with the UV radiation and the cold tar then it's likely you'll have to um, be hospitalized um, for that, uh, for that type of treatment, um, anti-metabolites, uh, can be used as well. Methotrexate is one of those type, uh, uh, medications that might be used to help prevent the, the, the spread of it. Um, phototherapy, you know, um, is something else they might use. Um, uh, photochemotherapy is something else that might be used for the, uh, the UV, um, if you have to have that UV radiation, um, those things might be used as, as well. And, and these are severe cases I'm talking about in severe cases. So nursing management, obviously we're going to educate our patient about the disease and, you know, whatever treatment is being used, you're going to do a thorough assessment of the skin, um, to make sure the lesions are healing and, um, new lesions aren't forming. You're going to do things to help um, keep the skin moist. So you might um, use humidifiers. Those, you know, help to increase the moisture in the environment, um, which will help keep the skin moist. You also might be using some type of lubricating lotions, but whatever lubricating lotions you're using, making sure that they're approved um, by the dermatologist. Um, you're not just, you know, picking and choosing something uh, that you yourself as the nurse has decided is something that's been um, ordered. Um, educating the patient not to scratch, um, you know, 
even little scratches minor in in the skin so if you get an abrasion or something in the skin um you know bacteria you know can get in there and trigger new lesions to form so um you know educating the patient about you know preventing um uh, scratches or abrasions or whatnot to uh, f keep them from developing. Okay, Steven Johnson syndrome. So this is actually just an allergic reaction, and this is an allergic reaction that occurs um, within 14 days of taking um, one of these medications. So like the Tegretol, the Dilantin, Bactrim, things like that. Um, within 14 days, you would have of taking that medication you'd have this allergic reaction. So you start to get these lesions and the lesions actually look like chicken pox um, uh, or, or whatnot. So you might see them on your face, your trunk, palms of your hands, soles of your feet, things like that. And so um, if you don't uh, take care of this, identify that this is Steven Johnson's and um, take care of the situation and this person can die. And so basically the the, the treatment is you're going to stop whatever that medication that triggered the allergic reaction. So whichever, you know, if I'm taking the Tegretol or whatever, if I'm taking one of these medications and it triggered this allergic reaction, then um, the, the thing to, to stop the, the thing from the thing to stop it from occurring is to stop the medication. If you don't, the person can die. OK, so let's talk about bacterial infections. So first, cellulitis. Cellulitis usually um, is the result from uh, from an infection from a, um, a staph infection. It can be caused, you know, from other organis organisms, but it's typically from uh, a staph infection. A break in the skin integrity almost always precedes uh, the infection. So let's see, what are you going to look for? Signs and symptoms might be uh, a tender, warm, erythematous, swollen area, um, usually like a warm, red, tender streak um, you, you might see it as well. And so the person might have fever and chills with this uh, condition as well. Um, so you're going to treat it with, uh, they, the person might have IV oil or oral antibiotics, um, depend, depending on the severity of the infection. They also might use burrow soaks, which, are, which is a topical antiseptic to help uh, with the pain because it may be, um, may be painful. If gangrene occurs, the patient um, would likely probably need some type of surgical debridement if gangrene were to occur. Um, so they might need some type of debridement in, or incision and drainage of the uh, surrounding tissue. So you're going to, as the nurse, you're going to monitor the patient's vital signs um, every four hours. Typically, um, you're going to assess the patient every four hours uh, to see if there's an increase in size or if there's worsening pain. And so usually um, the uh, the uh, the red in area is uh, marked so you can tell has it gotten larger or whatnot you're going to mark it to determine you know is it growing outside the area you originally um, marked um, as the nurse of course you're going to administer the antibiotics the analgesics maybe they need some warm compresses um, you know if ordered or whatnot uh, fur uncles are boils and boils are um, inflammation of a hair follicle, and that's caused by a staph infection as well. So, these um, any any area where you any area of the skin where you have hair, it can uh, get infected affected, you know, by with these boils. So it's just an infection uh, inflammation of the um, the hair follicles. Um, This is this is just a picture of the of a, a boil or a, a, a fur uncle. A carbuncle is a collection of infected hair follicles. 
So you got a collection of infected hair follicles. So again, anywhere um, you have hair, but usually these carbuncles, you know, are typically maybe on the back, on the neck, um, the, the lateral part of the thigh or, or whatnot would be common areas for the carbuncles to occur. And so again, red, painful, swollen area. Um, it could be draining. Um, if, you, if you develop an abscess, then of course it can cause you to have the fever, the chills, the malaise, all that as well. And this is just a picture of uh, what a carbuncle would look like. For treatment for um, the, the furuncles or carbuncles, um, you want to cleanse the site with warm water and probably like an antibacterial soap two or three times a day. Um, maintain standard precautions as always with everyone. Um, warm, moist heat might be applied uh, to help with comfort. You want to teach your client that um, some things that might contribute to, to it are uh, inadequate hygiene, poor nutrition, um, prolonged skin moisture. So, you know, patting the skin dry again, um, any type of skin trauma, tight, heavy fabrics um, on the upper legs, all those things could be contributing factors as well. Instruct the client um, who uses razors to throw away old razors, use clean, sharp razors, um, avoid any irritating lotions or creams um, on the area as well. Um, and some of the lesions, you know, like I said, might need um, incision and drainage as well and, and a culture and sensitivity um, depending, you know, on the severity of it. Um, and, you know, some you might be able to use some type of um, medication therapy as well. If an abscess does form, like I said, you might need um, incision and drainage um, to the area. Uh, rinse it real well after the bathing so that they don't leave any soap on it because that could be irritating to the, um, to the area. Uh, clean towels and washcloths every day because um, you don't want to, you know, wash with that infect and then you get the infectious drainage on it and then wash again the next day and, you know, cause an infection, you know, spread an infection somewhere else. Um, washing your linens, you know, uh, regularly as well. Okay, so let's talk about viral infections. One type of viral infections would be herpes simplex. You can have, um, there are two types. You have type one, which is non-genital uh, herpes simplex, which can be um, oral, or you can have um, type two herpes simplex, which would be genital um, herpes. The herpes simplex virus is actually spread by direct contact with contaminated body fluids, and it has an incubation period of about two to 14 days. Um, once you have the the, the disease is not uh, curable. You can resolve the, the symptoms, but the virus is actually um, embedded in in the nerve. So once you have the once you have the disease, the virus um, is embedded in the nerves, and so you can have um, uh, a reactivation or exacerbation um, of the infection. Um, commonly precipitated by some type of stress or illness or um, uh, excessive UV light or skin irritation or fevers or, or something like that can um, cause an outbreak. It will cause the uh, virus to actually travel uh, to the site of infection and, and cause a, um, a, a, a recurrent infection. So, um, like I said, there's no um, drug that's going to completely cure it. Once you have it, the virus is um, embedded in the nerves, and um, and uh, you can have a uh, exacerbation of it if you have some type of stress or something. Um, so, assessment: you're going to um, see your primary symptoms will be uh, malaise, fever. Um, you might see uh, 
some type of vesicles or lesions on the, the lips or the mares if it's non-genital or type 1. Um, when you see it on the lips, sometimes they call it, call it um, a cold sore, a fever blister or something like that you may have heard of, um, heard it be called. Uh, secondary symptoms might include tingling or burning sensation um, prior to the outbreak of the vesicles um, on the mucosa area. Um, treatment. You want to advise your patient to, to get plenty of rest. Um, you want to teach and encourage them appropriate hand hygiene to prevent the spread of the virus. Um, comfort measures, they might use like a petroleum jelly or a lip balm or something for the uh, oral lesions. Um, to prevent spreading the virus, you want to uh, teach your patient to avoid close contact with um, other individuals while the lesions are present. And uh, most likely advise your patients to use latex condoms even if they're asymptomatic to prevent spreading uh, any type genital lesions as well. Um, they might have some antivirals like the Zovarex or Valtrex or something like that. Um, warm compresses uh, might be used after they after uh, benzoin aids to uh, that can help dry um, dry the lesions and, and heal the heal them. Um, the person can be contagious. Let them know they can be contagious for up to five days after um, the lesions appear. This is a picture of um, herpes simplex. Your book also on page 996, figure 43-2 has another picture. Um, so you can see another picture of what uh, herpes simplex might look like. Um, these are non-genital, um, of course, um, which is the type one. So like I said, even if um, there aren't any lesions present. Um, if you have type 2, which is the genital herpes, you still want to encourage the, the, the patient to use um, latex condoms to prevent the, the spread of um, uh, genital herpes because it can still be transmitted even if they don't have any lesions present. Um, like I said, if there's a cold sore or something, you can use um, lip balms they use that uh, lemon balm for those for the cold sores um, you know can be helpful um, want to teach your patient don't uh, share drinking glasses with other individuals or don't share uh, eating utensils don't share lipstick or chapstick or anything uh, like that um, don't touch the lesions because you don't want to touch the lesions and then you know touch somewhere else um, on your body or touch, you know, someone else or, or whatnot. So um, teaching your patient all these things to try to prevent the spread of uh, the infection. So herpes varicella zoster. So um, when you see varicella, varicella is um, chicken pox. And then when you see um, zoster, that's shingles. So um, any individual that has, again, this the same the same concept. If you've had um, uh, if you've had chicken pox, then it uh, is dormant in the the uh, peripheral nerves, and so any type trauma or stress or whatnot. Once you become older, if you've had chicken pox or varicella. Um, in, in your younger years, once you, when you become older, you are at risk for developing herpes zoster because the um, virus is actually embedded in the, in the nerve ganglia. And so um, there is a vaccine for children to try to prevent um, chicken pox um, at this point, but like I said, patients that have had chicken pox are, um, have the potential of developing 
uh, shingles or herpes zoster later in life. This is actually a picture of um, herpes zoster or shingles. And so as you can see, um, it's like a cluster of skin vesicles that um, appear unilaterally uh, on the skin. And it, it goes along the path of one of the, the sensory nerves. Um, and it's usually on the trunk or um, the trunk or the face. Uh, when we talk about herpes zoster or shingles, it's usually associated with a, a tingling, a itching, a burning, and it's typically pretty painful um, for patients. The lesions are pretty painful for, um, for these patients. They might have fevers, um, they might be warm, the area might be warm um, to touch. They're probably, you know, um, having a lot of fatigue or whatnot as well. So, like I said, with herpes zoster, it's usually characterized by fever and malaise. Uh, within two to four days, they probably will have severe deep pain, puritis, remember which we said is um, itching. Um, they might have some paresthesia, which is um, like a burning, itching, prickling feeling, um, or like a, t uh, a tingling sensation um, or whatnot. Uh, they might have chills, you know, related to that um, fever. They might have some GI symptoms as well. Um, so any individual that um, has never had chicken pox or shingles um, shouldn't take care of patients um, with um, uh, chicken, chicken pox or shingles. Uh, pregnant women should not care for, pregnant women should not care for uh, patients with chicken pox um, or shingles either. So as I said, there's no cure, but you can relieve the symptoms. Um, you know, the, the um, virus will be embedded in the nerve, nerves and can, uh, you know, resurface um, if some type of stress or trauma or something occurs. Um, the earlier you detect it, then um, you can get treatment started and um, and it's more likely to decrease the length and the amount of pain that the person uh, might have. So obviously you're going to provide, you know, uh, analgesics, or, you know, pain relief to help uh, relieve the uh, pain. They might have some antibiotics um, just to prophylactically try to prevent any secondary infections. And then, of course, the antivirals um, for the uh, viral infection itself. Um, corticosteroids might also be used to help uh, relieve any pain as well. Um, so, if obviously, if they're in the hospital, they're going to be on standard um, precautions. If we're talking about um, treatment of herpes zoster, they're going to be on standard precautions. Um, if they're immunocompromised, then you're going to also, you know, obviously use contact and airborne uh, precautions un until the um, lesions actually are crusted over. And that's per the um, CDC recommendations. Um, you can probably provide some comfort measures using um, an air mattress or bed cradle, um, keeping them in a cool environment. Maybe some wet dressings or those burrow soaks can also be helpful for um, to relieve pain. Um, oatmeal baths might be helpful. Um, and you know that's something you can get over the counter and those will help uh, help dry the um, lesions as well. Just teaching the patient to rest, avoid scratching. Um, or rubbing the um, affected skin, you know, where the lesions are, uh, wear loose clothing, uh, lightweight co cotton clothing could be uh, helpful as well. Um, to prevent viral spread to others, you want to um, try to avoid persons that might be at risk. So, um, again, 
<clears throat> individuals that have never had um, chicken pox or shingles or pregnant patients, um, individuals that are pregnant should not take care of, um, you know, these patients as well. They do have a shingles vaccine um, for individuals um, as well. And so um, usually individuals over the age of 60 um, or older with a normal immune system um, can, you, you know, take this shingles vaccine to try to reduce their risk of, um, of developing shingles. So nursing management, obviously, we're going to try to try to do things that are going to help to make the patient more comfortable, um, decrease their pain level or whatnot. So cold compresses might help. Calamine lotion um, is something that might help as well. Um, that's that pink lotion. And, uh, you know, I had uh, chicken pox at one point and um, that calamine lotion um it was very difficult to, to get off, you know, off your skin, um, you know, once, uh, you know, you were done with it. Um, diversional activities can maybe help uh, if they're in pain. So you're trying to, you know, divert their, act, their, their attention away from the pain. So some type of diversional um, activities can, you know, possibly be helpful with the pain as well. Um, just making sure they're getting at plenty of rest, plenty adequate nutrition um, as well to keep their immune system up. Um, and like I already said, um, if it's uh, if it's widely spread or if the patient is immunosuppressed, you want to use um, airborne and contact isolation precautions as well. If they're not immunosuppressed, um, if the lesions are localized or not widely spread, then you can use um, standard precautions. And like I said, um, you're going to use these transmission, um, per, use, put these precautions in place to prevent transmission until the blisters are crusted over. All right, so now you got fungal skin infections. So fungal skin infections. Um, it's called mycosis, but if it's in the lungs or in internal organs, then it's systemic mycosis. Um, so you got two types of um, fungal infections. You have the um, fungi that are uh, pathogenic to humans, which means basically um, it's the type of fungal infection that can infect, infect any healthy person, any healthy human. Um, versus opportunistic infections and opportunistic infections um, infect individuals with a compromised immune system. So, for instance, you know, patients with HIV or something like that, those would be um, opportunistic patients that develop a, the fungal infection um, and they have a compromised immune system. Okay, so you have several different types of fungal infections. You have tinea pedis, which is athlete's foot, tinea curis, which is jock itch, um, tinea the scalp, that, that would be um, a ringworm, tinea barbae, that's barber's itch, so maybe you go to a barber that um, used a pair of clippers on a client and um, didn't clean it in between, and, um, you know, that client had... Um, a fungal infection and then they used it on you and you got ringworm of the face or neck you know from the clippers or something like that that would be tinea barbae um monoliasis that's thrush and so thrush is um yeast infection in the mouth right candidiasis would be um yeast infection of the uh vagina um onocomycosis that would be fungal infections of the fingernails and toenails. So let's talk a little bit about tinea pedis, which is athlete's foot. And so um, you can catch athlete's foot by being in um, public swimming pools um, where other people may have stepped and, um, and then you go behind them and step. If they you know, have athlete's foot, you can contract it. 
in spas and public showers. Maybe you go to um, work out somewhere and um, use their shower, you know, after your workout. Um, you know, if you step on those public areas and someone has been there to have athlete's foot, then, you know, you could definitely um, catch it. And so that's why they uh, advise you to wear maybe those little plastic flip-flops or something if you're using a public shower, a spa, or even the swimming pool. If you're going to be standing at the bottom of the pool or anything like that, um, you could potentially spread it to other parts of your body. If you say, don't maybe you don't know you have it, and then you touch your feet and then touch other parts of your body, you could spread um, spread it to other parts of your body. So you want to um, teach your, your patients um, to avoid contact with the suspected, suspected lesions. Um, thoroughly, you know, uh, clean the environment to, re, uh, to remove any fungal scales that might have shed. So, um, you know, if they're at home showering or whatever, then, you know, of course, thoroughly clean you know, their own shower after, um, using it or whatnot. They probably should avoid sharing towels, um, or different things like that, uh, or, you know, some of those other, um, fungal infections we talked about, maybe avoiding, um, hair accessories or hair brushes, you know, especially if it's an issue like with lice, I'm um, not lice, but, um, ringworms or something like that. Um, they want to keep the involved areas clean, dry, exposed to air whenever possible, as much as possible. Um, wear light cotton socks. Um, you know, if you have to wear socks or whatnot, um, then maybe even change, you know, change them frequently throughout the day. Um, wear sandals or open toed shoes when possible and avoid, you know, any plastic type shoes. Um, you want to make sure you carefully dry the skin, um, like between the, between the toes after showering or bathing, um, apply, you know, drying or, you know, dusting powders, um, or something like that can be, be helpful. Probably teach them to put their socks on before their underwear so that they can avoid, uh, spreading it from the foot to the groin. Um, they might need some type of, um, topical antifungals, you know, possibly, um, some type of topical antifungal. And then, like I said, you know, wear like a flip flop or something, you know, if you're going to be showering or doing things, um, in public places versus using, um, uh, just being barefoot. We touched on pressure ulcers a little bit already. Um, so pressure ulcers um, are ischemic lesions of the skin and the underlying tissue is caused by external pressure over an extended period of time and it leads to impaired blood flow. And so, um, like I said before, it's going to, everybody's going to be different as to how fast they might develop a pressure ulcer. So a frail, old, a frail older adult um, that doesn't have good nutrition, dehydrated, uh, they're going to develop a pressure ulcer much quicker than uh, a healthy, well-nourished, well-hydrated individual. Like I said before, a person that's healthy, well-hydrated, well-nutritioned, they could sit in the same spot for two hours and probably not develop a pressure ulcer, whereas you had someone that was... Um, you know, didn't have good nutrition, frail, older, um, they sitting there for two hours and on, you know, something pressing up against their, their area, um, their, their coccyx or something, and they're going to develop a pressure ulcer. So everybody's going to be different. Um, a pressure ulcer develops over a bony prominence. So it has to be over a bony prominence in order to be called, um, excuse me, a pressure ulcer. So, um, you might have, um, ulcers you know say on the buttocks or thigh or something like that but that might be um uh 
urine associated or moisture associated or something like that and they're at increased risk as well but over a bony prominence which we'll go through on the next slide which are um, considered our bony prominences when we are lying or sitting or whatnot and we've talked about that shearing what that is and so remember I said um, when we roll in our patients we want to roll the patient completely and roll the sheet or blanket or whatever under them then roll the person to the other side and remove that sheet or blanket from up under the person versus just taking that sheet and snatching it from up under that person because that's what causes shearing and that's pulling that person's skin and can cause um, a potential skin tear. So these are what I talked about your pressure points um, for pressure ulcers. So when you're at risk for developing a pressure ulcer, these would be your pressure ulcers. These would be your bony prominences. So if you're laying on your side, your bony prominences where you could develop a pressure ulcer, your ear, your shoulder, your hip, um, the head of the fibula, which is, you know, where you can see where your knee is, um, that uh, lateral malleolus, which is um, like the, the side of the heel or whatnot, those are your bony prominences. When you're laying in a, a supine position, you can see where the bony prominences um, are there, the scapula area, the vertebra, the sacrum, um, and then the heels there, those are all um, bony prominences when you're laying supine. And then you can see here, when you're laying prone, um, the bony prominence, so like the iliac spine, so where your hips are, and the patella, which is your knees, those are all considered bony prominences that put you at risk for uh, developing pressure ulcers. Those are your pressure points where you can develop pressure ulcers. So remember, a pressure ulcer develops over a bony prominence. So we've talked about some of these already, things that put you at increased risk for developing um, pressure ulcers. So if you're not well nourished, so you're malnourished, um, you're incontinent, you're dehydrated, you're immobile because why, if you're immobile, you can't move yourself around like you need to. Um, you know, certain diseases such as diabetes, mellitus, um, obesity, you know, um, if you have issues with edema, excessive sweating, um, the elderly individuals, um, decreased level of consciousness or confusion because they don't think to move or reposition themselves. All those things can put you at a higher risk for developing a pressure ulcer. So if a person comes into your facility and is um, found out to be at risk for developing a pressure ulcer, you want to put things in place that can help uh, prevent pressure ulcers. So you're going to implement pressure relieving devices. Maybe they have um, air mattress or something like that. Um, positioning, repositioning them um, every two hours. Padding the, the side rails or whatnot using different pressure relieving devices in the bed and um, in, out of the bed in the chair or whatever. Making sure they have proper nutrition. Making sure you provide excellent skin care. If they're incontinent, you're going to, um, you know, wash them with soap and water. Um, in your book on page 1005, uh, box 43, 2, it actually has some best practices to, uh, for prevention of pr pressure ulcers. So I'm not going to read all of them. We'll just, you know, go through a few of them here. But like I said, repositioning that patient at least every two hours. Um, you you know want to do that if your person's at risk for. So that could be repositioning um, if they're in the chair or if they're in the bed. You're turning them every two hours or whatnot. Um, assessing the skin on every patient at least every eight hours. You know. So that's what once a shift you should be, you know, assessing your, your patient's um, skin. Um, you know, like we just talked about pressure uh, relieving devices. So pillows, foams, padding, you know, things like that to prevent um, relief pressure. Um, so take a look at, you know, that box on page 1005. 
uh, to, to, you know, kind of see what types of things you might want to put in place to um, prevent a, a pressure ulcer if you've identified someone as it being at risk. So um, the classification system that was developed by the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel is the most um, the most used system for staging pressure ulcers. And so you have uh, suspected deep tissue injury. So suspected deep tissue injury, um, the, the deep tissue injury is characterized by a purple or maroon uh, localized area of intact skin or a blood filled blister. And so that's caused by damage of underlying soft tissue from uh, pressure or shearing. And so um, a stage one, when we talk about a stage one, and so, you know, I often see uh, nurses that actually don't properly stage these. And stage one is, remember, is intact skin that uh, is that has non-blanchable redness so blanchable if it blanchable means when you press on it the skin color um, changes so it um, it lightens up when you press on it so this is intact skin that's non-blanchable and redness over a localized area. Um, darkly pigmented skin um, may not be visibly, may not visibly blanch, but its color may, may differ um, from the surrounding area. A type two is a partial thickness. So when we talk about type two, three, four, type two is partial thickness. So partial thickness, that means there's a loss of the epidermis and or dermis. So remember the epidermis is the top layer and then the dermis is right under there. So um, stage two, you have partial loss of um, the epidermis and possibly the um, dermis, but the, at the wound is actually open, whereas in stage one, it's not open. So when we talk about stage three, that's when we're getting into um, full thickness. So stage three and four are, um, are full thickness. So stage three is full thickness loss um, and it's down to the subcutaneous tissue. So remember we said you got the epidermis, you got the dermis, and then you got the um, subcutaneous tissue. So when we talk about stage three, it's down to the subcutaneous tissue, okay? Then when we get to stage four, that's definitely um, full thickness. So three and four are full thickness. So stage four is full thickness loss occurs um, it, with exposed bone and muscle. So we're down to bone and muscle when we have um, a stage four. Stage three, you, you're at the subcutaneous tissue. Stage four, you see bone and muscle. Now, with stage um, three and four, you might have some sloth present. And so sloth is that um, yellowish, um, gooey type um, tissue that you might see. It's dead tissue. And so that needs to come out for it to, you know, properly heal. And you might... Uh, get that out with the type of dressing that you choose or whatnot. Um, they might also have um, eschar, which is that black leathery substance um, that you might see in a stage, you might see that in a stage three or four eschar. And all that has to come out, has to be debrided before um, that wound can start to heal. Now, an unstageable ulcer is um, characterized by full thickness tissue loss in which the ulcer base in the wound bed is covered by sloth or um, or eschar. So it's covered so much by, it's unstageable because it's covered by so much 
um, uh, eschar and or sloth that you really can't see how deep the wound is so you can't see how deep the wound is until um you get rid of all that um dead tissue to truly see is this down to the uh bone and muscle at a stage four or is it sloth or whatnot now one other thing you want to remember about our pressure ulcers now we can go from um we can go one two three four but we can't backstage so you can't if you're at a stage four you're always at a stage four you don't go four three two one so what happens is if you have a stage four when it starts to heal it's called a healing stage four if you have a stage three and it starts to heal it's a healing stage three so we don't backstage we can go one two three four but we can't go four three two one it's called a healing stage four or a healing stage three whichever it is so this is a picture of a stage one pressure ulcer so you can see the skin is intact it's red and um it's gonna be non-blanchable so when you see um, these you want to measure obviously you're going to measure and we'll talk about you know what we're going to document but when we measure we're going to measure length and so length would be head to toe width which would be side to side and then depth and so this has no depth because it's not open so it will be length times width times depth in centimeters you're always going to measure in centimeters and um typically you know facilities might measure like once a week or whatever so that you can see if there's truly um, a difference um, in the size of it versus measuring every shift or every you know day you're probably not going to notice a big difference um, if it's like that but you can see this stage one is intact non-blanchable um, red area this is a picture of a stage two so remember stage two is partial thickness and so it's just the um, either the epidermis and or dermis so layer is missing so you see it's not real deep it's just um, a partial thickness um, wound there and that's a stage two but it is open and so oh the other thing I want to tell you when you're measuring you want to measure at the longest point so um, every wound is not going to be a perfect circle but you take the longest point and you're going to measure from the longest point to the you know longest so when we're measuring length whichever part of that wound is the longest that's where you're going to measure same thing with depth every part of that wound is not going to be even so you want to measure at the deepest point is where you'll get your depth this is a stage three so like we said when we're talking about stage three we're down to subcutaneous tissue so we're a little bit deeper than just the dermis we're down to subcutaneous tissue but it's not bone and muscle just down to subcutaneous tissue and like I said with this you might start you could possibly start to see some sloth which is not good you want your wound beds to be a nice beefy red in order for it to start healing and remember you want your wound bed to be moist so that that can also promote healing as well and this is a stage four so stage four like i said we're down to bone and muscle when we have a stage four and a stage four you're likely to definitely see some sloth and eschar with eschar is that black leathery substance and neither one is going to be good so you're going to have to remove that sloth and eschar out of there before that wound bed will start to heal and so that can be removed um, maybe the dressing that is chosen can be a debriding agent um, type dressing or it might need to be surgically removed uh, by the physician um, to so that wound can start to heal okay so like i said debridement is um, you're going to remove that that dead tissue um, because the wound is not going to heal as long as you have that dead tissue or necrotic tissue um, present and so um, the only time that they may not remove um, eschar is if it's on the patient's heel and so if that patient has dry eschar 
there's no edema, there's no drainage, no erythema, it's not boggy or anything like that, they're likely going to just um, leave that in place. Now, you're, um, when you're debriding, you can, um, like I said, you can have, it can be done by surgically, so cut away, or it could be done uh, mechanically with the, uh, the dressings that you choose. Um, they can do whirlpool baths to help debris. Now, wet to dry dressings, that's an old way that they um, used to do debridement. It still is a, a way to debris, but it's not so popular anymore because wet to dry dressings, number one, are very, very painful. And number two, not only do they remove the dead tissue, they also remove the good tissue as well when you're pulling it away. And a lot of times, most of the times, we don't use the wet to dry like they're supposed to be used because it is so painful to remove a wet to dry. A lot of times the nurse will wet it before pulling it off, which takes away that debriding action of, um, of that wet to dry dressing. And so then it doesn't serve its purpose. But there's some um, chemical products that you can use um, to serve as debriding agents. Um, or different type other dresses that you can choose um, to help debride um, if you, you know, uh, choose to, you know, debride it uh, using a dressing versus um, having it surgically removed. So when we are um, choosing dressings, you want to choose dressings that will keep the, you want a, a moist wound bed, you want a moist wound bed to promote healing. Um, it's also going to determine like a lot of things are going to go into place when you're choosing your dressing. Is your uh, wound draining a lot because you don't want excessive drainage. You don't want your wound to be draining excessively. So you might choose like an alginate or something like that that's going to help um, soak up some of that drainage. If you do have a wound that's pretty dry, you're going to want something that's going to moisten it, like a hydrogel or something like that to help keep it moist because you want it moist, but you don't want excessive drainage. Um, if you have a wound that you need to pack, you want to pack it loosely. You don't want to, you want to touch all the points in the wound, but you don't want to pack it tight because if you pack it tight, then you could, um, uh, run the risk of causing that patient to develop a, um, an abscess or something like that. Um, you want to make sure you clean your wounds with whatever, um, you know, solution is ordered. To, a lot of times it's not going to be normal saline. Um, if your wound has um, infection, then that can make a difference in the choice of what cleaning solution you use, what dressing you use, if it has some type of infection or something like that. So all those things are going to go into play when you're choosing what type of dressing you want to um, use. You definitely want to keep pressure off the area um, as much as possible. Um, you know, so, um, and those are some things too, if you're, um, now you don't just put a, a, a Foley catheter in a patient because they're incontinent, but if they are incontinent and say they have a, um, a sacral wound or a wound that's somewhere, you know, that that urinal stool is getting in that wound, then they might, you know, put a Foley, um, if that urine is getting in the um, wound, they might put a Foley in there to try to, you know, allow that wound to heal. So that might be a reason to put a Foley in because um, they're incontinent, but you're not going to just put it in because they're incontinent and you don't feel like changing the dressing. But uh, to promote wound healing could be a, a potential reason. So like I said, usually you're going to measure that wound once a week. Um, you're going to measure always length times width times depth. Um, and then uh, you're going to measure at the longest point and you're going to always measure in centimeters. Um, if there's um, undermining, you're going to um, measure your undermining and you're going to use your clock. So if it's undermining from uh, 9 to 12, you know, so that can tell the pers uh, person, you know, you know, where the undermining would be so that, you know, they would know where to pack it. Or if it were tunneling at 12 o'clock. So use your clock when you're talking about um measuring your undermining or your tunneling 
Um, you want to document the, uh, the amount of drainage, if there's any drainage, the amount of drainage. You want to document what that drainage looks like. So is it purulent? Purulent just means it contains pus. Is it serosanguinous? Um, serosanguinous means it contains um, some type of serum, which would be maybe a yellowish amber type color and blood tinge. Serous just by itself, it's that serum. Sanguinous is um, bloody. Um, so what preventive measures did you put in place? You want to document what preventive measures you put in place. If you did do a treatment, you want to document exactly what um, treatment you performed. Um, you want to document, um, you don't want to say things like, you don't want to say things like, um, looks better or appears to be healing or whatever. Just document the fact. And, you know, it's for that person to determine, oh, well, this is better than it was. So, you know, just to say looks better or, you know, yeah, it's healing, you know, that's not adequate. Just, you know, document the facts of um, large amount of serosanguinous drainage wound is, you know, uh, 10 centimeters by 7 centimeters by um, 3 centimeters or whatnot. Um, you know, you want to document if that wound has any odor to it. I mean, I'm sorry, the, 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 yeah, the, the wound, the drainage, does it have any odor? You want to document what the peri wound looks like. The peri wound is the area or the skin surrounding the wound. That would be the peri wound. You know, what does that, um, look like as well? So this is a picture of the braiding scale and it's actually in your book on page 1006. Um, so this is something that facilities typically use maybe when the person comes in and then they're based on their policy determining how often you would redo this. So it determines the person's risk of developing a pressure ulcer. So if, they're, if they come up that they're at risk for developing a pressure ulcer, then you want to put pressure relieving measures in or um, uh, prevention, pressure ulcer prevention measures in place to prevent um, a pressure ulcer from developing. So you're gonna look at their sensory perception um, and document this, you know, their level of moisture, really moist or constantly moist or whatever, their activity level, are they bed fast or are they walking a lot? You know, their mobility, you know, no limitations in mobility or are they just completely immobile, right? What's their nutrition status? Is it good? Is it poor? Whatever. Um, likelihood of friction and shearing, which we talked about, you know, and so um, then you'll come up with a score. If their ind individual is, you know, between 15 and 18, then they're at risk. Um, 13 or 14, moderate risk. If they're 10 to 12, high risk. Um, if they're at a nine, then that's severe risk. So, um, you know, anything at risk, I would be putting measures in place to prevent any type pressure ulcers um, from de developing. So this is just kind of a chart to show you um, if you see a certain color, you know, what kind of infection that person might have. Um, so if it's brown with like a fecal odor, so you know, they might have some bacteria in there. If it's like a creamy yellow, it might have some staph in there, you know. Um, so, you know, this kind of just gives you an idea. Green, bluish color, it might be some pseudomonas in there. So kind of give you an idea of the, determining the color of that um, drainage or exudate. Exudate means drainage coming from the wound, um, what that um, infection might be. So burns. So um, burns are, you know, you have injury to the skin um, caused by, you know, heat, chemicals, electricity, or radiation. So your burns can be thermal, chemical, um, electrical, or um, radiation. So when we talk about chemical burns, um, those are caused by direct contact um, with either an acidic or alkaline agent. Um, 
alkaline agents would be like your uh, industrial cleaners or fertilizer and these actually cause greater damage than acidic uh, acidic burns because the alkaline burns can actually you know melt melt the skin and so you know they're a lot can cause a lot more damage um, your electrical burns obviously you know caused by some type of electricity um, or, or whatnot and these will follow the path of least resistance so muscle bone you know blood vessels or whatnot anytime you have an electrical burn you want to um, implement car cardiac monitoring even if the patient is not having any chest pain or anything like that you always want to implement cardi cardiac monitoring for um, patients that have electrical burns so your radiation burns um, those are going to come from like um, sunburn or um, or radiation when you receive radiation treatment for like cancer or something like that it's usually a superficial injury um, but you know extensive spo exposure can lead to you know tissue damage or some type of um, multi-system injury so burns is all going to when we talk about signs and symptoms it's all going to depend on um, what caused the burn um, you know how long were you exposed to the the whatever caused the burn um, you know how much of the body is burned um, where the burn is obviously you know if it's um, neck or face you know we got to worry about breathing and things like that so all that's gonna um, impact you know the severity and the signs and symptoms that a person might experience um, they, it could be a blister it could be a scab you could have eschar depending on how serious you know it is or whatnot and so you know we'll talk about um, the different stages of burns as well so an estimate of the burn size is calculated using the rule of nines and this picture is actually in your book on page 1009 so you need to understand this rule of nines and how to calculate what percent of the person's body is actually burned so if we're talking the trunk so the front part of the chest is considered 18 percent um, we're talking you know front of the face and neck that's four and a half percent the front part of the, um, one arm is four and a half percent um, the genital area is one percent don't forget that one percent the front part of the leg is considered um nine percent and then if you turn the person around the back of the head and neck is another four and a half percent the back the whole back um and buttocks is considered 18 percent the back of one arm is four and a half percent the back of that leg is um you know nine percent so if you had a question you know and the question said um what if you had a patient who's um their posterior and anterior trunk were uh burned what percent of their body is burned the answer would be 36 percent because the anterior trunk is 18 percent and then the back is 18 percent so that's 36 percent or what if you had a, a question that said um you know the front and the anterior and posterior um, right arm was burned and um, the anterior right leg was burned what percent of the body is uh, burned so that answer would be not 18 percent right because if I said the anterior and posterior right arm so the anterior is four and a half percent the posterior is four and a half percent and then so that's nine percent and then I said the anterior um, right leg that's another nine percent for a total of 18 percent so just make sure you understand which parts of the body equal which percent so that you can be able to calculate what percent of that person's um, body is burned
So when we talk about classifications, um, same thing, you got partial thickness, full thickness. Our partial thickness um, wounds will likely, you know, be able to heal. You know, they'll, they'll heal, you know, appropriately. Um, maybe I got a, you know, a little burn on the stove or something like that. You know, that's going to heal, right? A full thickness, full thickness, um, same thing, full thickness, we're down to subcutaneous tissue. And so uh, possibly, you know, if we're at a stage four, we're down to bone and muscle. And so, um, you know, it's going to take a little more um, doing to try to, you know, heal this type of, of wound. Um, might need, might even need a graft, you know, depending on how bad it is. In your book on page 1011, table 43.3, it classifies burns for you, so it goes through, you know, characteristics of superficial burns, um, superficial uh, partial thickness burns, deep partial thickness burns, full thickness burns, and deep full thickness burns. So it shows you, you know, so a superficial burn might just be pink, red, maybe have some mild edema, pain, uh, you know, pain with this, uh it's not going to be a blister unless it's a um, partial thickness. Um, you know, your your superficials, you're not going to have any eschar, just like with your, um, remember we talked about with our pressure ulcers, eschar is not going to be present until you get to your full thickness um, areas. You could have some um, eschar in your full thickness wounds. You know, the healing, of course, on your superficial it's going to be shorter than um, your full thickness, of course. Um, and so possibly, like I said, depending on how bad it is, you might need a graph. So it gives you some examples of each as well. So when we talk about just a superficial burn, um, that's like your sunburn or something like that. Um, superficial partial thickness burns. Um, you scald yourself, you know, with some hot water or burnt yourself or something like that deep partial thickness um the, maybe some flames or something was involved grease might even you know cause a um a deep partial thickness um deep partial thickness um wound um and so so on and so forth so um you know take a look at that as well to try to understand um you know what's happening in each type of uh burn this diagram is also in your book on page um, 1010, 1010. And so it kind of goes through for you a little bit um, as well, talking about um, a first degree, a second degree, a third degree, and a fourth degree burn. So again, your first degree and second degree burns are going to just be partial thickness. So that's partial thickness again. Remember, it's just epidermis and dermis um, when we're talking partial um, partial thickness. So first degree is just the epidermis. Your uh, second degree, you're down to the, the dermis. Um, third degree, we're down to subcutaneous tissue. And then fourth degree, we're down to bone and muscle. So it depends on, you know, how you were affected it obviously if it affected your, your your lungs or you um even if you inhaled smoke or you know de depending on you know what type of burn it might have been your um emergency treatment for burns obviously you're going to want to um monitor the person's oxygen do they need oxygen um uh, monitor their pulse ox to see you know what's going on with their um their oxygen level um always you know airway 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 if if they can't breathe then you know nothing else really matters right assess their um carbon did they inhale any carbon monoxide um do they need iv fluids um as well we talk about the emergent phase of burns that's like your first 24 to 48 hours possibly first three days um after a burn and so um, during that time, if your patient hasn't had a tetanus shot within the last five to 10 years, they're um, gonna uh, have a tetanus 
um, injection. That'll be the only IM injection that they will um, receive. The most important nursing diagnosis for the patient with burns would be, uh, say, ineffective airway clearance, um, maybe related to increased secretions or laryngeal um, edema, um, or maybe impaired gas exchange related to tissue damage resulting from smoke inhalation or something like that. And so your expected outcomes for that patient are going to be that your patient has a patent airway, um, they have regular and easy respirations at about 12 to 20 breaths per minute, their lung sounds are clear on auscultation. So those are going to be, uh, your, you want your O2 stats to be um, somewhere around at least 95% or something like that. So respiratory support is going to be your first um, primary concern. If the patient is at risk for airway obstruction or inadequate breathing, then these problems um, have to be managed before the uh, burn itself can be treated. And so, um, you know, whether it be they get intubated, they get 100% oxygen or whatnot, but if they're not breathing, like I said, nothing else matters. So that's going to be the primary uh, concern for you at that time. Next, the um, next um, nursing diagnosis that will uh, potentially be an issue during this emergent phase will be fluid volume deficit related to um, active fluid loss because a lot of times when you, um, depending on how bad the burns is, you might have a shift in your fluids from um, the uh, vascular space into the extracellular spaces. And so to prevent hypovolemic shock and maintain um, good cardiac output, the nurse is going to um, begin rapid fluid resuscitation. Um, of course, as it's prescribed, they'll probably prescribe something like a lactated uh, ringers or something like that to help uh, manage that patient. And then um, obviously pain management is going to be a big issue for these patients as well. So first aid for minor burns, this is actually in your book on page 1011, that box 43.3 um, gives you instructions if you have just minor burns. You want to um, run some cool water over the burn for about 10 to 15 minutes, just cool. You don't want ice or ice water or anything like that. If you don't have running water, you can use a cool compress or something like that. You don't want to put butter or different ointments or things like that on there. You don't want to pop the blisters. If you've got a, um, a sterile gauze, you can wrap that loosely around the burn or whatnot. And um, for the pain, you can just take something like um, ibuprofen or acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, um, for the pain if needed. So like I said, your biggest issue your or your priority is rather is going to be um, respiratory issues that could possibly develop after a burn so these are just some signs and symptoms that um, they may be having respiratory issues maybe they inhale smoke maybe um, you know was their neck burned or you know whatnot um, and causing issues with respiratory so it, things that you want to look for that respiratory problems might be an issue. Do they have burns to their face and neck? You know, are their nasal hairs singed or darkened or or whatnot? Um, do they have smoky smelling breath? Do they have darker black sputum? All these things are going to be indications that maybe they inhaled some smoke or maybe you know they got burned and their lungs um, or something. Um, uh, do they have a burning sensation in their throat or chest? Um, you know, so, you know, all those are, might be indications that resp you might need to watch their respiratory, um, watch for respiratory problems because that is going to be your main um, focus when we're talking about um, prioritizing issues. All right, so the acute phase, so according to your book, the acute phase extends from the time of fluid mobilization and diuresis until to when the burn area is completely covered 
by skin grafts or when the burns are healed. So that's considered your acute phase. And so the goal during that phase is um, obviously management of pain, anxiety. Um, you want to try to prevent um, any type infections from occurring promote nutritional intake and um, rehabilitation therapy. So you might um, have escarotomy, which is with, with that one, it's a, um, an incision is made in the escar to um, try to relieve pressure, um, relieve pressure under that area. Whereas remember we talked about debridement was when we actually cut away that dead tissue or necrotic tissue is um debridement and then you have um grafting so you might need to take um you know tissue or you know good skin from an, another area to try to um put on the, the burn area um as well um, we'll talk about these complications here um on our next slide in the rehabilitation phase as well on our next slides so when you have fairly large large size wounds, like I said, you will get a shift in the, um, the fluid. And so one of the, um, the, something that could potentially happen with these large size wounds is you get a shift in the blood flow to the brain and heart and the liver. So get that shift in blood flow to those essential areas, right? And decreasing, the, which is gonna decrease the blood flow to areas such as the GI tract. And so if you decrease the blood flow to the GI tract, you're going to um, risk, you know, decrease in gastric motility. So you want to um, monitor that, you know, monitor uh, peristalsis um, in the GI area. Um, do, do they have any, you know, abdominal distension and ulcers? Um, that might be, you know, causing blood in the stools and things like that, as well as they might, um, contractures might be an issue for um, these patients as well. So as soon as they get stable, as soon as they get stable, you want to try to, you know, get some physical therapy or some type of, you know, regular exercise to try to prevent um, contractures once you get them stabilized. all these would be some signs of infection um you know of the wound you, you know like with any wound does it have a strong odor is there a change in the color um you know are the um wound edges are they are they red um is it warm to touch you know um is the exudate purulent meaning does it have pus do they have does it slothing in the area or whatnot all those would be some signs of um, infection that you want to monitor for. So for nursing care, you know, what we've been saying, these people, you know, especially depending on the extent of the burn, are going to be in a lot of pain. So we're obviously going to, you know, do things to help manage the patient's pain. Um, you know, all the, like we said, all those things we're going to monitor for, for infection. So we want to do things that we're going to try to um, prevent infections as well um, you know if they're having issues with um, itching you know helping manage you know those things as well making sure they have good nutritional support so all that's going to help promote um, wound healing giving them you know good nutritional support psychosocial support depending on how bad it is you know it could mess up you know mess with a person's psychosocial um, abilities or whatnot so you know, providing, you know, that for them, um, educating the patient and their family, you know, community care. So, you know, when they go home, do they need any services um, as far as that goes um, once they go home to help uh, manage and provide, um, you know, rehabilitation. Um, Sometimes they actually might need to go to a rehabilitation facility, you know, to help um, continue to uh, not only heal the wound, but um, uh, improve their level of functioning um, as well. And so that can take a while as well.